Hi guys, and welcome back to the Early Bird Photo News. It's been a while since the last news update because over the last few weeks, I've been traveling in the remote outback in Queensland, looking for unique and rare bird species. In total, we traveled more than 8,000 kilometers looking for these birds. And in the end, we were pretty successful. I took over 60,000 images and got more than 20 new species in all in all, some pretty great photos and videos. So I'm very happy to be able to be out there again because over the course of the last year, this wasn't something I could always do. So being out there again in nature with the bird, enjoying the peacefulness of the outback was pretty amazing. If you've been following me, you know that I'm very adamant of using tripods with my big 600 millimeter prime lenses. But on this trip, I basically handheld all the time and this was mainly due to the nature of the little birds we were photographing. We were photographing a lot of little emu wrens, grass wrens, so birds that just hop around, hop up on a perch, hop down on the ground and just are all over the place. And at times I found the tripod just too difficult to use. So I was hand holding a lot and got quite good results. The only thing I noticed is with hand holding, I definitely need higher shutter speed. So I tried to at least have like an 800th to a thousand of a second most of the time to get nice and sharp images. The only downside of hand holding so much was that I get not as nice video because hand holding video, at least with the Canon lenses, is not the easiest task. What about you guys? Are you more into hand holding or do you enjoy using your tripod so you can give your arms a rest from time to time? One big issue in the Outback, of course, is dust. We had to clean our front elements and our cameras and even our sensors almost on a daily basis because when you change an extender or just drive around, there's so much dust floating around that you continuously get dust on your front element and also on the rest of your camera. So this was something we had to be quite careful with. Also because, especially the dust on the front element, sometimes distracted the cameras when focusing, especially when you're shooting in a weird sort of light angle. So now that I'm back home, the biggest task I had to do was go through all the images and videos that I took and that was more than a terabyte and more than 60,000 photos. So a little bit of work, but I was using Photo Mechanic and I just quickly scroll through all my images, tag the ones that I want to keep and then delete the rest. If you're not really sure what to look for or use a program where it takes too long to go through the images or look at them at 100%, it will probably take you too long. It will be a big task to go through these images. Whereas if you're using a program that at least gives you fast previews like Photo Mechanic or Fast on Image Viewer, for instance, you'll have a much happier time, even though going through 60,000 images is never really fun. I haven't edited that many images from the trip yet, but one of my favorite images I've already edited is of these two painted finches. I didn't really expect to photograph this species, but one morning my friend said, let's go to this spot. I think there will be some and fair enough, we were standing on these rocks and first nothing was happening at all. And then after a little while, bang, a few of these finches landed right in front of us and we got some really cool images of this pair. There were a few challenges with this image when it comes to editing it because the rock was still in the shade, the birds are kind of half in the sun, half in the shade, and then the background was fully lit by the sunlight. And this image is also a good example why I love using my pro sets because with the Adobe colors, the reds of the bird just didn't look quite right and the overall image looked a little bit muddy. Whereas once I put the right pro set on, the colors improved dramatically and it helped me to tweak the image to get it to the perfect starting point. And once I opened the image in Photoshop, I had to do a few more tweaks that I teach you in my masterclass to get it to the perfect final image. In particular, I worked on the female. She had that one sort of big puffy area that I shrunk a little bit with the liquefier. I stretched it out a bit. And I also worked on that bright spot on the female chest that had a lot of color cast and looked a little bit too bright and did a few more tweaks, few more curves, few more selective color layers and then balance out the overall image and I got to the final image that I like quite a lot. And if you want to learn all about image editing and how to make those tweaks and get the perfect colors, make sure to check out my masterclass and pro sets down there in the description. On this road trip, I was shooting with two R5 bodies, my 600 millimeter F4 lens and the 100 to 500 millimeter lens. And my friend who was with me was using a Z9 and the 800 millimeter PF lens. And from time to time, I grabbed his lens. I was really amazed how nice and light and balanced it was. I was actually a little bit jealous because it was so easy to handle. The viewfinder was so stable. And whenever I used it, I had quite a good time with it in the field. So overall, that lens is very nice. and. Definitely a good choice for many Nikon shooters. My 600mm lens also performed very well, even with the 1.4 and the 2x extender, so there's no complaints there. Both systems delivered very well in the field under these challenging conditions and dusty conditions in the Outback. 
Ken and Rumors made a very interesting post this week about some new potential lightweight lenses coming from Canon where Canon launched some patent applications. And one of them is an 100 to 600 millimeter 5.6 to F9 lens. So while we don't know if Canon will ever actually make a 100 to 600 or 150 to 600 millimeter lens, at least it's good to know that they're working on a lens like that behind the scenes. Because over the course of the last year, we've seen a few patents and patent applications for lenses like this. There was 150 to 600 millimeter lens, and now there's also 100 to 600 millimeter lens. So fingers crossed that they follow into Nikon's and Sony's footsteps and make some sort of nice 100 to 600 millimeter lens. We also got some speculative updates on the upcoming R5 Mark II that will launch probably sometime next year. And one of them is that it will likely have a 62 megapixel stack sensor, dual CIF Express Type B card slots, eye autofocus, and a few other cool perks. So if some of these at least come true, I think it will be a pretty amazing camera. And for me, the most important thing is really that it has a stacked sensor so we can get rid of the rolling shutter effect and these image wobbles. And hopefully also Canon working on the buffer so that when you hit zero, you don't have that little break because Sony and Nikon, for instance, just keep shooting if you hit the buffer. Whereas if you hit zero on the Canon buffer, you kind of get stuck there for a little while, which is not great. Over the last few months, there's always been rumors that there would be a big, R5 firmware update that would kind of make it almost an R5 Mark II already or give it a lot of the R6 Mark II features for instance and now it looks like that was just hot air that rumor and it's not really happening. The big firmware update was really the pixel shift where you can make a 400 megapixel JPEG file or something like that but in terms of actual features or removing things like the 2959 record limit, it seems like it will likely not happen anymore, especially because we're so close now to the launch of an R5 Mark II potentially as well. So Canon will likely divert more of their attention to the new camera rather than working too much on firmware updates for the old cameras, unfortunately. I mean, the R5 is an amazing camera and it works fantastically well in the field as it is. So it doesn't really need a huge update, but at the same time, it would have obviously been nice to get some of these features that an R6 Mark II or an R8 have, for instance. And while we may not get a big firmware update, it looks like we will at least get a bunch of new lenses between now and the end of the year with 8 to 10 RF lenses to be scheduled to be released over the next few months. So that's pretty exciting. And I'm wondering what lenses may it be. One of them is probably the 200 to 500 millimeter lens, but other than that, I expect it to be some shorter lenses, like some wide angle prime lenses that a lot of people have been waiting for as well. So all in all, it sounds like it will be exciting times ahead in Canon land with two potential cameras coming out sometime over the course of the next year, the R5 Mark II and the R1, and lots of new lenses. So fingers crossed that there will be some nice ones for all of us. While I was gone, Sony has also released the A7C2 and the A7CR, one 33 megapixel and one 61 megapixel camera, which all in all sounds pretty amazing. The C in them stands for compact and they are certainly compact. They're quite small, but pack a punch with similar features to the A7 IV and the A7R5. From all the reviews I've seen, these two cameras look like they deliver very well in the field. They're probably not as much for us nature photographers, but as an everyday carry around camera or B-roll camera or a smaller camera to take with you, I think they would work very well. Alongside these lenses, Sony has also released a new 16 to 35 millimeter lens that's a little bit smaller than its predecessor. Not a lot of news in Nikon lens, but it looks like the first people have actually received the 180 to 600 millimeter lenses, which have been shipping from sometime last week onwards, I think. Have you received yours yet? Have you tried it in the field? How do you like it? Make sure to let me know in the comments. At the end, I also wanted to give you a little update when it comes to these SSD drives, because as you know, in the past, there has been a lot of talk about these drives failing left, right, and center. And Western Digital, Sandus, has now addressed it with a firmware update that should apparently fix the issue. But I guess for a lot of people, it's kind of a little bit difficult to decide, yes, I trust these drives again. And personally, I've decided going forward, I will build these drives myself. So you buy these M2 SSD drives for that are meant to go into a computer and then you can also buy separate cases for them like USB-C cases and you can assemble it yourself which should be more price efficient and actually also delivers you faster transfer speed so that will likely be the route that I will be going for but, but I'd like to hear from you guys as well are you going to buy those SanDisk and Western Digital drives again going forward or are you looking at something else
And that wraps up the early bird folder news for this week. Make sure to let me know all your thoughts in the comments and also check out my channel membership where for a small monthly fee, you can join my channel, support me directly and get some cool membership perks. Besides that, make sure to give me a thumbs up and hit that subscribe button and I will see you in the next video very soon. Bye guys.